The John Muir Trail runs 211 miles through California's Sierra Nevada mountains from Yosemite National Park south to Mount Whitney, the highest point in the lower 48 at 14,505 feet. Since permits are so hard to come by out of Yosemite, I decided I would go northbound starting at Cottonwood Pass Trailhead at Horseshoe Meadow in Inyo National Forest near Lone Pine, California. From there, it's about a 30-mile hike to the summit of Mount Whitney, the official start of the northbound John Muir Trail. My three-week permit was valid from August 20th until September 11th, which coincided with California's largest wildfire of 2015. This meant I needed to average around 12 miles per day to complete my hike on time. After flying to Reno from my home state of Maine, then taking a bus to Lone Pine, I hitchhiked up the zigzag road to Horseshoe Meadow. At an elevation of 10,000 feet, it was a perfect place to spend a couple of nights to begin acclimatizing before heading north. There are two trailheads at Horseshoe Meadow, Cottonwood Pass and Cottonwood Lakes, both of which connect to the Pacific Crest Trail and later the John Muir Trail. I chose the Cottonwood Pass Trail because it is a bit shorter and has fewer elevation changes. My first day wasn't too bad considering I was carrying about a 50 pound pack with more than 10 days of food. It was hard, no doubt, but it felt great to finally be hiking after nearly six months of planning and preparation. Since I could only fit around seven days of food into my bear resistant food canister, I needed to camp my first three nights at sites where food storage boxes were available. I used Upper Crabtree Meadow as my Mount Whitney base camp for the 16-mile round-trip summit climb. Around sunrise on my third day, I secured camp and left with only a lightweight day pack, carrying some food, water, my first aid kit, and a few extra warm clothes in case I would need them. I thought about how it must feel to be an astronaut, to leave the security of the ship, perform a highly rewarding mission, and then safely return to base.
Just above Guitar Lake, I felt quite intimidated standing at the base of a 3,000 foot wall of Sierra granite in the shadows of the morning sun. But the path up the west side of Mount Whitney is a remarkable trail making feat with a series of switchbacks consistently leading upward. I think it was here on these switchbacks that I learned the value of coordinating my breathing and my footsteps into a healthy rhythm. Traveling so light and with purpose of pace, I finished my 30 mile approach and was on top of Whitney before noon on August 22, 2015, ready to officially start my John Muir Trail. By day four, I had begun to notice a pattern to the atmospheric conditions. Mornings were clear and bright, temperatures in the mid to upper 40s, and little if any wind. Daytime temperatures in the lower 70s were ideal for me, and throughout my entire three weeks in the range of light, not a day threatened rain. But smoke was the cost for lack of precipitation. Usually, in the early afternoon, a gentle westerly wind would rise and smoke from the rough fire would weave its way up the canyons and fill the air. Fortunately, my breathing was not affected, but I met several southbounders with stories of fellow hikers who had bailed because of the annoyance. Conventional wisdom on the trail is to set up camp at a relatively low elevation, close to passes so you can tackle them early before storms roll in. While fortunately not necessary on my hike, I found early morning travel quite serene and peaceful with often no southbound traffic. After a short mileage day and a good night's rest, it was time for me to climb Forester Pass the highest on the trail at 13,200 feet. Like Mount Whitney, many parts of the trail here saw some exposure.
There were many parts of the trail where I felt lucky to be going northbound, like just after Forrester Pass. I descended for miles in the thickening afternoon smoke to Lower Vedette Meadow where I made camp for the night. Shortly after dinner cleanup, a juvenile black bear visited me, but like a scared dog, it slinked away after I banged a cooking pot on a log. By this time in my hike, I would have expected a voracious appetite, but due to the altitude or improper planning of desirable foods, I still wasn't eating very well. I wasn't getting as many calories as I had planned and it proved very evident on my climb up Glen Pass by having to make several stops to fuel myself. One of the benefits of a solo hike is the complete freedom of choice. On the day I climbed Glen Pass, I felt very low energy, so I decided I would have another short mileage day. I set up camp in the shadow of Finn Dome on Lower Ray Lake. It looked like a popular camping site but I was the lone traveler there that night. I was now, as it turned out, in the heart of the smokiest section of the trail. By late afternoon, the sun would be a glowing orange disc and the landscape dramatically layered. That same view the next morning would be just as remarkable, but pleasantly and surprisingly different. Well rested from a good night's sleep and enjoying clean air, I decided to push my schedule by a few miles to see if I could put the smoke behind me. I had camped close enough to Pinchot Pass that climbing two passes in one day was feasible with Mather Pass ten miles beyond. After yielding to a mule team with its resupplies, I was on top of Smoky Mather Pass by late afternoon. I descended into the basin to set up camp by early evening at the north end of Lower Palisade Lake. And once again, morning broke with the air crisp and clean. Another instance where I appreciated my northbound route was descending the Golden Staircase. A mile and a half of tight switchbacks that connect the Palisade Lakes Basin with the Palisade Creek Valley and an elevation change of roughly 1,000 feet. Its construction was finished in 1938 
and was the last section of the John Muir Trail to be completed, 46 years after Theodore Solomons began the trail project in 1892. I made my way up LeConte Canyon to set myself up nicely for the next day's hike to Muir Pass. The upper part of the canyon was sweetly solemn. Dawn was unusual in that the air quality was poor early, then cleared some as the morning progressed. As I gained altitude, the sky turned a deeper shade of blue and the air was still. I passed Helen Lake, named after one of John Muir's daughters, in utter silence. Muir Pass hides itself well from northbound hikers and it was only until I was almost upon it that I saw Muir Hut. The long gentle descent from Muir Pass took me through the lunar landscape of Evolution Basin and into Evolution Valley where I made camp for the night. By now, my food supplies were running low, but the San Joaquin River and I were closing in on Muir Trail Ranch, where I had mailed a five-gallon bucket filled with my next week's worth of food. The ranch is close to the trail, so it's a very popular resupply destination for hikers. Most people, myself included, end up shipping too much stuff in their buckets, or food that's not now as palatable as it sounded at home. So there are several hiker buckets with supplies galore to choose from or make donations to. I was craving protein, specifically jerky, but couldn't find any. The climb out of Muir Trail Ranch is a challenge especially with the dramatic increase in pack weight. As I was making my way up the switchbacks out of the valley, I noticed some very large bear prints on the path along with a very large pile of fresh scat. 
I soon caught up with another northbound hiker and asked him if he had seen the unavoidable pile. He had not. It did make me happy, though, that I had first-hand confirmation of what bears do in the woods. The John Muir Trail and the Pacific Crest Trail share the same footpath for around 160 miles. Most Pacific Crest Trail through hikers travel south to north, passing through the Sierra Nevada in late spring, early summer, when in many years river crossings and snowy passes can be a challenge. But on my late summer hike, these weren't a concern nor were mosquitoes, which can be fierce earlier in the season. Flowers and wildlife were abundant. Perhaps my favorite campsite was just next to Silver Pass Creek, a tiny meadow nestled in a small valley just before Silver Pass Basin. Adjacent to the grassy field is a lovely garden of glacial erratics, the exposed granite polished almost countertop smooth. I grew to almost enjoy the uphill efforts knowing that my reward would often be hours of relatively easy downhill travel. Inevitably, there would be a collection of jovial hikers resting at the top of each pass, eager to swap information about the conditions on the trail. The most common question I would be asked by southbound hikers was, how is the smoke where you came from? To which I replied, annoying but tolerable. Their response to the same question from me was commonly, it gets better beyond your next pass. Two weeks into my hike and it was at Lake Virginia that I first saw ice on my tent. The morning warmed up quickly though as the sun rose over the eastern peaks and hiking conditions were very pleasant. On my entire three week hike my rain gear went unused. Despite years of drought in California Water is rarely far away on the trail, 
and always cold and clean. I did filter my drinking water because, like wearing a seat belt, it's easy to do and why take the risk? Hiking downhill most of the afternoon, I passed through the charred landscape from the 1992 Rainbow Fire near Mammoth Lakes and into Red's Meadow Resort. At last, I could finally satisfy my protein craving. While at Red's, I also did some laundry, took a hot shower, and had a big hearty breakfast before visiting Devil's Postpile and getting back on the trail to head north again. By the time I left camp at Rosalie Lake, I was ahead of schedule with around 50 miles to Yosemite Valley and six hiking days left on my permit. I decided I would take my time breaking camp and to take longer rests at scenic spots. Also, it was Labor Day weekend and there was a noticeable uptick in daily traffic, so I would have frequent chats with other hikers. And it was no wonder it was crowded there. Garnet Lake and Thousand Island Lake are located within the Ansel Adams Wilderness, and I felt as if I were walking into one of the famed photographer's images. It was difficult to keep my eyes on the trail. Fortunately, the trail is very easy to follow, and only once did I stray. Instead of reading the trail sign, I focused my attention on an attached missing hiker poster and then kept hiking. After a few hundred yards, I realized the trail was noticeably less traveled than normal. I retraced my steps and quickly got back on course. I used the GPS app and also carried a compass and the Tom Harrison maps, but the Guthook app was quite valuable for strategizing my water supplies and campsite planning. After a late start, I was atop Donahue Pass by noon on my 18th day of hiking. Having never been to Yosemite, I felt gratitude to first step foot in the park through such a remote entrance. I met a southbound hiker from Sweden and we ate lunch before each heading in our own directions. Not an hour later, as I was descending the upper Lyle Canyon, I met an elderly couple who were hiking northbound as well. They too were from Sweden, but probably only nodded a polite hello at their fellow countrymen as they passed them earlier in the day. Once in the valley, the hiking is not difficult in Lyle Canyon, as the Lyle Fork of the Tuolumne River snakes its way towards Tuolumne Meadow. It really felt like I was in the home stretch, even though I knew I had some elevation gains to come.
My wife had sent me a resupply box to the Tuolumne Meadow Post Office, and I arrived there on Labor Day. Luckily for me, it was the only post office in the country open on that holiday. At this point, the wilderness experience was replaced by the hustle and bustle of travelers squeezing the last drops of summer out of their vacations. I spent the night at the backpacker's campground, but returned to the trail as soon as I could the next morning. In September of 2014, the Meadow Fire had burned several thousand acres on Yosemite's south rim, including a section of the John Muir Trail. Since I had read glowing praise of Cloud's Rest and I had some extra time, I took a detour at Sunrise High Sierra Camp. I left the John Muir Trail to bypass most of the fire damage and hiked to the Sunrise Lakes to camp for the night. The following morning, with the sound of helicopters and airplanes overhead, I made my way to the top of Cloud's Rest. This, this is a little nerve-wracking. It's about a 2,000 foot drop this way. And probably a thousand foot drop this way. Oh my God, it's so beautiful. As I had been informed by all the southbound hikers, the air quality had improved as I headed north. Unfortunately, the day after I entered Yosemite National Park over Donahue Pass, the Tanaya fire broke out on the north rim of Yosemite Valley. So once again, depending on the wind direction, smoke filled the air. With plenty of time to spend, I watched the full-scale aerial assault. Now, with 6,000 vertical feet to lose and less than 10 miles to the end of the trail, it really was downhill nearly the rest of the way. Views of the iconic Half Dome, almost a thousand feet lower than Cloud's Rest, dominated the trail. I rejoined the John Muir Trail and spent my final night at Little Yosemite Valley Campground, leaving me with less than four miles to the Happy Isles Trailhead for my last day's hike. I sauntered down the final miles into the valley, relishing the smoky views.
I wanted a grandstand with people cheering as I stepped off my last few paces, but met instead a mob of onlookers marveling the views and snapping pictures, as oblivious to my adventure as I was to theirs. Which is fair enough.